Open your Bibles with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the, Lord, the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, he will have no form of comeliness or handsomeness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted, acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He will, he will be, it's a metaphor, a root out of dry ground. He's trying to draw a mental picture. Isaiah sees something. He sees Messiah is coming, but he says this is different. The atmosphere, the, the environment in which he will be planted into will not be conducive to growth. He will come out of extreme adverse conditions, but those adverse conditions will not determine the outcome. You may be facing adverse circumstances, but they do not have to determine the outcome of your life. You may have come out of a troubled home, family. You may have come out of abuse and pain. And you may be in a mess right now, even while I'm speaking to you, wherever you're watching this or hearing this message. But he emphasizes the unfavorable conditions the Messiah would appear from. That's a pattern. That's a Bible principle. He is not moved by the unfavorable conditions that we struggle with. And it may feel like you've got a son or a daughter, a mom or a dad, that it's just not the condition that God could really do anything in their life. You don't understand the principle that He's a root out of dry ground. He, doesn't, he does not need anything from that person for him to do what he does. Whew. Hallelujah. He mentions the lack of physical attraction concerning Jesus that he would not possess. That he would not fit the stereotype of previous Jewish leaders. For example, David, the Bible said, was handsome. He was comely. He was handsome, unusual, uh, features and strong and handsome man. The Bible says of Saul, the first king of Israel, he, he looked like a leader. He, um, he stood a head and shoulders. The text says physically of his stature was a head and shoulders above every other man in Israel. When he walked in the room, he stood out. He looked like a winner. He looked like a leader. He fit all of the criteria of uh, uh, someone who would grab the attention of masses of people, not Jesus, not Jesus. He will come to power out of dry ground, barren. It's a description of someone who would appear to look like they do not have much of a chance to survive, not to mention to thrive and grow and take over the world. What a joke. The times in which Jesus came and was born was a time of immorality. Immorality was rampant. They, sexual immorality uh, was rampant in the world in the time that Christ was born. They were serving multiple gods, false religions everywhere. Hate was stronger than love. But it's in that dry, barren desert of a land that suddenly the tender plant begins to take root and grow. The high priest's religious system was corrupt. They had been invaded by Babylon, been invaded by Persians, been invaded by the Greeks, and by the, now conquered by the Romans. And Israel had, was just a shell of its glorious past. They were not a powerful nation. There was nothing. It was dry ground. Jesus, in the lineage of David, had lost the lineage of David had lost the crown, had lost its glory. It was no big deal to anybody but Jewish people. The Romans could care less. They laughed. You have to understand that had he descended from Caesar, had he descended from uh, uh, Pharaoh or some powerful 
person who had armies and wealth and power, that might have given him a little chance to actually become someone that could change the world. But this is just a route out in the desert. It has no hope. There's nothing in the circumstances around it that will cause it to grow up and be anything. His identity as a Jew added nothing. It was an honor to be a part of the seed of Abraham. Only among the Jews, it meant nothing. Judaism had lost its thrill. It was nothing but legalism. It was nothing but ritualism. Had he been Greek, had he been a philosopher, had he been a Roman citizen, at least he would have some kind of pathway to, to becoming powerful and mighty but he was just a root out of dry ground. His birth, think about it, was not in a royal nursery. It was in a barnyard. And then to add to that dry ground, he lived in the city of Nazareth, and the question was asked often. It was a saying. It was, a, it was part, if you wanted to get a point across of how pitiful somebody was, they would say, can anything come good out of Nazareth. Every time he introduced himself as Jesus of Nazareth, it said to that culture, he's, he's from trash. He's from nobodies. There is no lineage. There is nobody powerful. There is nobody influential who has ever come out of Nazareth. It's really amazing that this tender plant didn't just spring up, but he grew, the text said. That tender plant that came out of the most adverse circumstances overcame where he came from because he had been planted in the, in the earth. And that tender plant grew in a magni into a magnificent tree of life that would bring shelter and would bring shade to the troubled brows of men and women who had the sun and the pressures of life and the diseases and the hopeless situations, they run into the sh shadow of the Almighty and they find the secret place where there's healing and there's help and there's hope through Him, through those conditions, out of that place of obscurity, in the middle of barren, dry, dry ground comes the root. The tender plant didn't die. I want to announce this morning he still lives. The root out of dry ground is still alive. It's easy to get your eyes on this world and you see all the craziness, the woke culture. You see everything that's going on. The evil is called good and good is called evil. And nowadays it's almost like you, you, you feel like this, this is this little world is so wicked and so evil and we get discouraged and we forget he didn't come into a perfect society and he came into dry ground. So if the schools and the universities have kicked God out and, it, and it's, you know what, that's just dry ground for Jesus to be planted and he'll prove it again. I don't need anything to change this. All you need to do is what you're doing. Fast and pray and seek me and then get the seeds of the word of life and start planting Jesus everywhere. It's dry, it's barren, it's lifeless, and if he ever gets room in any condition, it doesn't matter how bad it is, he will start growing. Why did he grow? Because he was God manifest in the flesh. He needs nothing outside himself to survive. He is self-existent. He did not need the help of men to survive. He did not need political connections to survive and thrive. He didn't need position, power, wealth. He didn't need any of it, and he still doesn't. He can do it all by himself. He's God, and he was manifest in the flesh. He does not need soil that's fertile to survive. Well, we got to approach God that way. We got to get back to that. Because if we don't watch it, we get to thinking that, boy, you know, you know, I, I'm really something. No, you're not. He did not need soul. He did not need anything. He could have chosen anyone. He could have used anyone. When I look at this ministry and I see what God is doing, 
I want you to know he did not have to. I have not done this, and you have not done this. All we were was people who said, I'm going to give him some room. I'm going to give him some space. My life is the dry, barren wilderness. I am nothing. I have nothing to offer him. But boy, when I dropped him into my barren life, he took my mind. He took my body. He took my heart. He took my dreams. He took my vision. He took my talents. And he said, let me see what I can do. You can't do it on your own. I could do it through anybody, but since you gave me room, I'll, 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 I'll let something grow out of the dryness and barrenness, uselessness, fruitless life that you are. The soil contributed nothing. The soil, dry ground doesn't give anything, doesn't support the plant, doesn't support the growth. That's the power of Jesus. He's self-sufficient. Plant Jesus in a nation and watch what he'll do. Plant Jesus in our schools. Oh, I want to scream it. Plant him, plant him. But he can fix our schools. He can fix education. He can fix our economy. He can fix the church. He can fix the problems in the family and the home. He can fix all the gender confusion. Plant Jesus. He's not afraid of it. He likes, he likes the uh, circumstances that are adverse for, for him. He actually likes to go to crack houses. He actually likes to go to strip clubs. He likes it. I didn't say you need to like it. I said he likes it. Stay out of there. You ain't, that, you ain't got that much, Jesus. You just sow it. <laughs> Come on, y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. I, I'm starting to feel this thing kick in. Plant Jesus in Africa. Plant him, plant him in the jungles of South America. Plant him in communist China and watch that church come out of dry ground. Plant him in socialist Europe and watch that church come alive. I'm not giving up on the world. I'm not giving up on the nations of the world. Plant him in Russia and they can say God's not real, but watch him. Watch him. He doesn't need the government. He doesn't need the president. He doesn't have to have anybody. He just needs a space. Plant him in downtown Atlanta. Plant him in Southern California. That's what we did. And I get so aggravated when I go out there sometimes. It's just a crazy, godless, money, money, money is their God. Things, homes, this, that, the other. People told me, now you're going to have to change when you go to California because and I walked in and I screamed like I screamed. I preached and I just plant Jesus and thousands of people showed up to the glory of God. It works wherever we go. I guess what I'm trying to say is don't you give up on anybody that you have on this fast on your mind because the Lord says, I am the root out of dry ground. You see no circumstances that show any positivity that Jesus is going to grow there. He says, you just keep planting me. And I want to tell you an incredible story, true story. In 1949, Billy Graham went to Los Angeles, California as basically he was known in the Baptist denomination as a young evangelist. But they had not heard of him nationwide or any worldwide, certainly not. He felt like God wanted him to put up his tent in Los Angeles and have a crusade in the middle of Hollywood and the city of L.A. And he had a press conference and a few came and they searched the papers the next day looking for PR that would help build the crowd. And not one article was written. But there was a woman, once the revival started, it started and it was just kind of bumping along a few hundred people. There was a woman who was a Presbyterian lady and she was a Bible teacher. Her name was Hen Henrietta Mears. And she invited Billy Graham one afternoon while he was preaching that crusade to to her uh, Hollywood Hills home there in 
California to speak to a group of Hollywood personalities, very influential, the biggest movie stars, some of them of that time. And there was a country western star by the name of Stuart Hamlin, who also hosted a local radio show live every day that covered all of Los Angeles. He was one of the biggest movie stars of that day in that era. He was infamous for his drinking and carousing with women and brawling and gambling. That was what he was known off of the movie screens. And he had a huge, huge, huge following. And that day at that lunch in that woman's home with several people, Billy Graham and this man, Stuart Hamlin, they connected and they took a liking to each other. And Billy Graham began to long to see this man who was far from God come to Jesus. The campaign went on for three weeks as he preached under the tent and not one time did Stuart come and hear him preach. But he would call him and they would eat meals and they would talk and laugh. Just had to make a decision, Billy Graham did. At the end of the three weeks, his, his sponsors came, his, organiza his organization people, and they said, um, we feel momentum is building this third week. We think we should go a few more weeks with the crusade. And Billy Graham had never done that before. And he said that he was hesitant because he had never done it before, but he said, I'll pray about it. And he said he prayed about it. This is Billy Graham's words. And he said he asked God for a sign. Should I go on with that meeting in Los Angeles? The next morning at 4.30 a.m., he received a call that awakened him in his hotel room. It was Stuart on the other line. He said, my wife and I, Susie, need to come see you this afternoon. Can we see you at your hotel? He met with them at the hotel, and they talked about his life, how broken his marriage was, how messed up his life was, how addicted and bound he was to alcohol. And that night, for the first time, Stuart went to Billy Graham's crusade and broke and walked down the aisle and gave his heart to Jesus Christ and was gloriously, gloriously saved. Shortly after that meeting moved to another place, Stuart Hamlin, this movie star, had a dear friend. His best friend was a man who was the largest movie star of that day. His name was John Wayne. They were neighbors and lived in the same neighborhood. And John had been off filming and had missed the whole revival of Billy Graham. For months, he had been filming on location. He came back into town and Stuart said, I felt the need to go share with my friend how Jesus had changed my life. They had partied together. They had done everything that Hollywood had to offer together, fame, fortune, and Stewart said he went to his home that night and he had gathered some of the other friends in the neighborhood because he hadn't seen them for months and they were having a dinner. And he said the subject came up and they all began to talk about, and this is the subject, how people can solve problems within themselves. And everybody had their own philosophies. Not one time was God or Jesus mentioned. And they got to Stuart Hamlin. And they said, what do you think? He said these words. He hadn't written the song yet. But he said, it is no secret what God can do in a man's life. Two hours later, he went to leave. And John Wayne got up and followed him to the door of his mansion. And he said to Stuart, he said, you know what you said? It is no secret what God can do. He said, that's a powerful statement. It got me right here. You should go. John Wayne told him, this is his own words, why, where the inspiration came from. He said, you should go home and write a new song and call it, It Is No Secret What God Can Do. This is a heathen telling. He said he left 
John Wayne's home went a few houses down, sat down at his piano in his own mansion, and within 17 minutes, he wrote the words and the music. The chimes of time. Oh, I want to sing this a minute. Ring out the news, another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. I love this. Was that someone you? For there is no power that can conquer you while God is on your side. Take him at his promise. Don't run for the door and hide. It is no secret. Do you need a miracle this morning? Come and stand. Do you need freedom this morning? Do you need God to do something you can't do? Are you in adverse circumstances and you don't know how to change them? in some area of your life. Slip out of that seat and walk down. Humble yourself. Give him room. Don't be like the room keeper in the Bible, the hotel keeper that said, I don't have room in the end. Give it to him. Make room for him in your heart. Walk down that aisle at every campus. Walk down that aisle and give it to Jesus. It's no secret what God can do. There are so many of us who could say, all we did was make room for Jesus, and he made something beautiful out of our lives. God does not need the perfect circumstances in your life to do the miraculous. Your part is to make room and say, God, I give you room in my mind. That's why you're watching this program. You are already doing that. You would have flipped the channel, but you're making room for Jesus. And when you plant Jesus into your life today, when you plant him into the battle you may be going through, the marital situation, the family issues, just plant Jesus into it. I speak freedom to you today. He can change it all. And I want you to invite him into your life. Just pray this prayer today. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender to you. I plant you into my barren dry desert and you're the root out of dry ground you don't need circumstances that are perfect for you to work in my life and that's why i have hope today and i praise you we plant you into every desert wilderness dry place and lord we thank you that you're our provider jehovah jireh in jesus name amen and amen. If you just prayed with me or you would like to pray with someone, it blesses us so much to hear about how your life was changed through this broadcast. So please call the number on the screen or visit the website that we have there on the screen. There's so many free resources we'll send you. Now I want to invite you for our annual 21-day fast. If you don't understand how to fast, I'll be your fasting coach. I we'll have so much material plenty of fasting resources. This is the 20th anniversary of the year that I wrote the first book on fasting that uh, became a New York Times bestseller because people were awakened to the message of fasting. Go online and get your resources today. Before I go, I cannot end this broadcast without thanking from the bottom of my heart all of you who have been giving to the newest initiative that we are involved in in the nation of Israel. We've been giving to Israel, and, and I this, say this for the glory of God, we have been able to sow millions and millions and millions of dollars into the nation of Israel over the last 20 years. But we're taking on something this time that is really, I think, the most beautiful thing that we've done thus far. We're building the Eshkel Resilience Center. Thank you for helping us. My announcer is going to tell you more about this exciting 
and I believe prophetic project that we're involved in in the nation of Israel. Over the past five years, friends and partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries have worked to help build an amazing Kingdom Play School, four fortified bomb shelters, and a fire station for the Eshkol region in southern Israel near Gaza. Thankfully, we can report that these shelters and projects played a vital role in protecting Israeli families from this terror attack. Together, we have stood shoulder to shoulder with the brave people of these communities for years. That's why we're partnering with the Jewish National Fund to help build the Jensen Franklin Media Ministries Eshkol Resilience Center. Here, Jewish men, women, and children who suffer from PTSD, anxiety disorders, and other emotional trauma will find state-of-the-art facilities and treatments in light of the devastating circumstances here in Ashkol on October 7th, the need for psychological support is critical more than ever. Thank you, Pastor Jensen, and all your partners. We know that you have our back yesterday, today, and in the days to come. Thank you. Let's stand united with Israel, build resilience, and bring comfort to those who need it most. Call or go online today to see how you can get involved. This program has been sponsored in part by friends and partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries. Your prayers and financial support make these programs possible. For more information about this message and other ministry resources, visit us online at jensenfranklin.tv.